2017 marks a very special year for Castle Vale, and in particular, Greenwood Academy. Or, as generations before have known it, Castle Vale Performing Arts College, Castle Vale School, or the Comp. Not only is it the year that we moved to a fantastic new building, but it's also the school's golden anniversary. 50 years of memories lie within this school building, and we wanted to find out a bit about the past and what has led to us becoming the school we are today. We could have done that in so many different ways, through the eyes of pupils or the perspective of parents, but we'd heard so much over the years about Bill Barnett and how his vision for the school still lives on 50 years later, so we thought, what better way to chart the 50 year history than through the various eras of the school's head teachers. The man who set the foundations for all of us when he took up the post of head teacher of the newly formed Castlevale Comprehensive School in 1967 was Bill Barnett. Bill Barnett was a larger than life character and he was the sort of guy who, wherever he was, whichever institution or walk of life he was in, he would depose himself in his particular culture. He's a very flamboyant man, very smart dresser, bow ties, um, uh, had time for everyone, could talk to beggars, could talk to kings. Uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say he was the heartbeat of the school. You had a sense about Mr Barnett that there was a real single-mindedness. Um, I mean, of course, he took over um, Castle Vale at, at the, the infancy of the comprehensive movement and um, he clearly um, was very driven to make a, a, a highly successful comprehensive school. His catchphrase was, I can. So if he could, he expected you to. And that's what I liked about him. He was very simple in, and direct in terms of his communication. Um, he was a gentleman. He always wore a dicky bow, uh, often with a flower. Um, you would often see him with, in his gown, particularly on formal occasions. He um, provided what every good head should provide, and that was that the f he wanted the focus of every member of staff to have at the, the head of that focus the fact that they were there for the children. Uh, we had a very distinctive uniform, which was very Bill Barnett, you know, sort of grammar school almost in the way the, 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 the children appeared. He was very strong on the arts. When you walk around the school, the walls were, 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 were always full of art. Uh, he was very keen on performing arts. He just used to get the children that would probably never have an opportunity to sing or act or anything. And he just used to get them doing it and they were just fantastic. They were, I mean, I still remember them. I still remember the children that were in them. You know, they had a really big effect on me. And uh, in fact, he sort of gave us guidance to have some staff productions, uh, which was very useful. Remember, if we had nearly 2,000 children, we probably had nearly 140 staff. So to get that unity, to get that sense of feeling, of teamwork, we found those productions, even though it sounds a small thing, all the staff come together, very important for team building, for understanding each other. Um, he was quite a complex man, really. He was very, very dedicated to teaching. He really used to like to bring the poorer children on. I'd say that he was, he always fought for the underdog. But he was also very, very strict, very, very strict. We had to be brought up properly. But I think it's given me quite a moral code, really. Oh, he's a disciplinarian. I mean, you know, he told everybody off from the deputy heads downwards. But whenever you, you crossed him in the corridor, he made, you, he made you feel that he knew exactly who you were. He wanted to know things. Billy Barnett was always walking around the corridors. He used to wear steel tips on his heels so you knew he was coming. He would say, because, you know, if the kids heard him coming, they'd put the fags out and, you know, everything would be fine. But you always knew Billy Barnett was coming. He spent a lot of time in classrooms. He was a teaching and learning man. Uh, you know, he, he, absorbed the, he absorbed the tone of the school, the, uh, the pulse of the school, by being around the school. He was very, very active. Spent very little time in his office. I think he did sort of, it was like his whole life, the school. Definitely. Bill Barnett had a year off to be president of the National Association of Head Teachers. And my father-in-law was a teacher who went on a conference with him during that, that one year. Uh, I think Bill just decided that he'd had enough, uh, that the taste of freedom 
was, uh, was enough for him and uh, I think he just went, decided to go. It was clear from early on in our research that the vision set out by Bill Barney at the outset of Castlevale Comprehensive School was a vision shared not in its entirety but certainly in part by subsequent head teachers over the next four decades. However, the transition between Bill Barney and his successor wasn't necessarily a smooth one. When Derek Pritchard arrived, um, the, the whole atmosphere of the school changed. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very much uh, a huge difference in leadership style, really. Uh, Billy Barnett, as, uh, as, as, as I said uh, earlier, was uh, uh, a larger-than-life, flamboyant, uh, extrovert character. Uh, Derek Pritchard wasn't. He had his own leadership style. Uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was more introvert than, than Billy Barnett. Barnett was just so driven. He was, he, you, you knew exactly what he wanted and you had this sense that he knew, more importantly, exactly what he wanted and he would get it, you know. The, the sense for me with Pritchard was it was a job. He, he, didn't, he didn't fill you with confidence. Um, he, he, he didn't give a sense of leadership as far as I was concerned. I think if you wanted to approach him, you could approach him, uh, but he's, he wasn't ever one of the lads. He never tried to be that. He kept a distance between himself and the staff. Oh, it was impossible to tie down, yes. I mean, he was, ex I say, he was pretty well the opposite of Barnett, who was, I mean, Barnett would um, put, I don't know, 100, uh, 11, 12 year olds into the dining room and teach them all maths. <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, the girl said Pritchard wouldn't do, it wouldn't go in front of her class. I never felt when he was here that he uh, was committed to the school and I think that was a feeling felt by quite a few other people. At the time I was just as annoyed as everybody else by him because, you know, he, he just didn't seem to have it, uh, any interest in the school. Um, but looking back, anybody, I mean if Dave Walters, Walters had had to take over straight away, uh, you know, instead of Pritchard, then he would, he would have found it much more difficult to do what Pritchard did. This was a time, though, in fairness to Pritchard, where he was having to oversee uh, a lot of staff uh, leaving because the numbers were dropping. And it was a time also of redeployment, where staff were told that there's no place for you now on the teaching staff, but there's a place over there, another school in the city. So several staff were moved. Uh, I didn't really uh, have a lot to do with Pritchard. He seemed okay. He did say to me one day, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And then he said, but neither does any other head in this country, <laughs> which is probably true. It was clear that the warmth and fondness in conversations about Bill Barnett didn't echo through into those regarding Derek Pritchard. However, in the fast-moving world of education, there was soon a new head on the horizon. Derek Pritchard's time uh, came to end, I think, after about five years uh, through a series of uh, circumstances um, that led to his uh, retirement, in effect. Dave Walters, who was the acting head, applied for the job. Well, he was, <laughs> he was impressive, Dave. I mean, he was the suits, the the posh suits, the flower, everything else. He was exactly the kind of head teacher that gave Castlevale prestige, I think. And people would look at him and, and think that he was an important person doing an important job. Um, a lot of our principles coincided, which is one of the reasons I'd enjoyed working there. So we believed in the same thing. And fundamentally, that was that the school was about the children and about giving them the best chances. So I really enjoyed working with him. But the school was falling in numbers, uh, the reputation was deteriorating, the reputation of the estate was deteriorating and uh, we were up against it really. And was seen as the man who had the knowledge, if you like, to take the school through what was going to continue to be a difficult period as falling roles were still uh, affecting the, uh, the school and the staff. Um, and we were losing half a dozen to 10 members of staff each term. Uh, so you could lose 20 or 30 staff over the course of a year. Not an easy time, 
Um, and Dave, um, such a nice man, uh, a caring man, uh, well respected, um, and had to make some very difficult decisions. Dave, Dave had this, if I got to the end of my tether with a member of staff or, or an issue or children or whatever, I would go to him and say, can you support? And, and I, by that time I'd be kind of trembling with anger with whatever was not going right and I couldn't do anything about or seem to do anything about. And they would go into Dave's office and I'd think, oh, thank goodness for that. And within 10 minutes, gales of laughter would be heard coming out of his office, which is really frustrating, but it's the way he got things done. It was Dave Walter's initials in the mid-1980s which marked the end of an era and which caused much debate amongst our current pupils. It looks like something Willy Wonka would use, you know, when he's like instructing the little oompa things, but, like the little cane, like where you'd walk. <laughs> looks like a walking stick. Well, to me, this stick looks, looks like... like a walking stick. No, it looks like something that you beat people with. I think, I think it's a cane. I know that this was used, obviously, as a punishment. I know that if you were a naughty, I know some of my family members have spoke to me about uh, how the cane was in use. The cane? To, was it to walk with? But I understand why they did it, to like show their pa the teacher's power over the students so it would stop them from behaving because they'd be scared of the cane. It would have kept pupils a lot more in order than they are today. I don't agree with the whole cane situation. Like I like the school, like the punishment system that we have, like red card, amber card. I think that's more effective because kids would be scared to come into school, like getting caned by the teachers. If this came back into action, people would completely disagree with it. I believe that this shouldn't be brought back, but you know, memorabilia to be to be looked back on and to kind of look how lucky we are that we're not getting hit with a cane for doing something silly in class. I think some people deserve to be caned but not, not for a lot of small things, I don't know. I find it better how they've diluted the system down, so like that it's cards instead of hitting people. But some, what if you deserve it? Mm, yeah, I, I do have some Nobody people, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't agree with this. Like, teachers shouldn't be allowed to hit the students, no matter how naughty they are, but some people might be an exception to the rule. I don't personally think cane in people is a good system. I think the detentions are a lot better. I wouldn't like going home with marks on my body, to be fair. Thankfully, discipline in schools has moved on considerably. The abolishment of the cane wasn't the only change ahead. He felt a break would benefit him. Um, it was at a time in education when education was linking with business. And I think it was through the Barclays company that he got the offer uh, where school leaders were given the chance to go out into industry and out into the world of work. And he got the offer of a, a two-term secondment. Janet and I made a conscious decision. We weren't gonna wait for Dave to come back. We weren't just gonna hold the reins. We were gonna do something positive. Um, and so for about four or five hours, uh, we just chatted through what needed to be done. I think he, w he, went, he went off, that's right, on this industry-based program and I was acting head and I think that should have lasted for two terms and I think he retired during that time and I was sort of half in charge and half not in charge which is quite a difficult position to be in because you're carrying out somebody else's job not your own job and I began to realise that there were things I would like to do uh, things I would like to change to improve things and uh, so when he retired there were two reasons. One is because I wanted to do those things that I applied for the job. And the other is, as a deputy, you kind of go with the furniture <laughs> and you have to take on the policies and the principles of the people that get the job. That's the job of a deputy. And I wasn't confident that I could do that if it wasn't something I agreed with. Yeah. So I thought I might as well get the job. When Dave went on his secondment, she was the natural choice um, to take over as acting head. Janet Putman became the school's fourth head teacher. The first female head teacher to take the reins and at a time when pupil numbers were critically low. The task of transforming the school's fortune lay firmly in Janet's hands. There were some staff who were petrified, A because she was a woman and B because she hadn't any previous experience of senior leadership. Personally I, I thought she was a good choice um, because I I could dial into her values and, and 
uh, she knew exactly what was needed to improve the school. I thought Janet was a remarkable head teacher. Whatever she felt internally, she came across, particularly when I was with the authority and getting to know her as a head teacher, she came across as fearless. Uh, but it was a very strong personality, bubbly, you know, I called her the butterfly because she flitted around all over the place. Uh, I couldn't keep up with her uh, in terms of her thinking and thought processes. Um, but she was uh, well respected, uh, but not backward in coming forward. She worked hard. Um, she expected other people to work hard. She wasn't frightened of difficult conversations if you didn't work as she expected you to. But if you did, she was fiercely loyal to you, very supportive, and just made sure that everything you did was in the interests of the students and the community. And so there was a kind of ethos there that um, Ida was enjoyed and appreciated. We were now probably at the, the rock bottom in terms of the falling roles. Three form entry, um, 63 kids in that three form entry. Well, the numbers went down to about 63 in a year group. Um, and people wouldn't come from off the estate to go to the school on the estate because they had misconceptions, I think misconceptions, of what it was like. You, you can have a vision for Castle Vale School, but if they're told it's going to close in September, your vision's out the window. So you have to make sure that the school was going to survive uh, because they were looking to close schools. The publicity around was shocking, um, very negative. None of the positives were ever spoken about really. So you only had people from the estate to send their children to the school at the time really because nobody else would. And then people who felt I think that they had aspirations would try and send their children off the estate to Sutton or to, to various other schools. So we were losing the children from the estate but we also weren't gaining any at all from outside. That's what we had to change. If we hadn't increased the numbers within two, three years, that would have been it I think. It's the biggest priority was to change people's view of the school. With the major transformation vital to the school's future success, I was keen to find out from Janet what ingredients paved the way for that to happen. There were a number of things that happened at the same time. The Housing Action Trust arrived. The Labour government came in with a really strong and genuine push towards supporting education. And Tim Brighouse arrived at the local authority who was, you know, could walk on water as far as most people were concerned. So the three things coming together, it, you know, it's a perfect storm really for, for taking that job. And because of what was going on in the Vale in terms of, you know, increasing numbers of families, there was a feel-good factor that permeated everything because the school was growing and being seen to be popular. I think, I think if you keep one principle at heart all the time, which is it's got to be what's best for the children in the school. Everything else that happens is manageable really. So pressures from above, Ofsted, government changes, local authority changes. You just have to decide how to make them work so it's the best for the children in the school. And, and therefore it, it becomes quite easy really. It felt as though it was growing because it was a good and improving school, which it was. And so you had all those things coming together. With growing pupil numbers, an improving reputation and a real feel-good factor about the school, things were on the up. By the time Janet decided that we needed now to, to kick on, she could either take a deep breath and go again for another five, six, seven years, or was this time for her to move on to other things. And move on is what she did, having placed Castlevale School firmly back on the map. Enter head teacher number five. A new head was appointed, Clive Owen. Uh, he was already uh, in situ as a head of Frankly School. I found Clive a brilliant person to work with and I will be always indebted to him. Uh, he was open, he gave me the freedom to take the role in the direction I wanted to and now it's something that as, as a head teacher now myself, I've put into practice. I had plenty of conversations with Clive Owen and the impression that he gave to me was that he was a good guy who wanted to do his best for the pupils and who supported teachers when he could. And he was working really, really hard for the young people. He really, really believed in what they could achieve and he worked very hard on their behalf. I know that there were some 
differences of opinion between Clive and some of the staff. I work very well with him. We had a lot in common. He was an intelligent man who had the best interests of the school and its pupils at heart, and he did a lot of good too. I, I could show you the letter he wrote me, you know, for my retirement book, and it's very nice, you know, and he actually says, over the eight years or whatever we were together, I don't think there was much that we disagreed on. He left a lot of good memories, and a lot of pupils will regard Clive Owen as a very, very good head teacher, given the difficult exam results the difficult Ofsted inspections, the fact that teachers felt that they were under some pressure to make progress, but they felt that they were not making progress. The man in the firing line was Clive Owen. Clive Owen departed. There was no head teacher. After a period of unrest, 2012 didn't quite provide the period of stability that was needed. 2012 was a, a turbulent year for Castlevale School. It was the year that it became an academy, but it, its passage from local education authority school to academy school was, was not an easy one. An announcement was made by AET that they had got a new head teacher, and this head teacher was going to be a whiz kid. Now, the head teacher, of course, was Charlotte Blenker. Charlotte was only at this school uh, for a few months. So I think you've got to say that she didn't really have a chance to make much of a, a lasting impact. But in terms of what she could seriously do for exam results at the school or the ethos of the school, there was very little. After just a few short months, Charlie Blenko moved on and the school still hadn't found the stability it was crying out for. I think it's fair to say that people were losing hope. Simon Turney, uh, followed in the uh, wake of Charlotte Blenko and, and, and Simon was just what the school needed. He was a head teacher of a school in Tamworth. My, my brief that I was given was to go in really and just provide a level of calm and, and a level of engagement with the community, with the students, with the staff. The school was damaged at the time, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to say, uh, and I think the school and its community felt undervalued and, and probably quite vulnerable. He, he had a, a good way of going about engaging with parents and engaging with pupils. He was a no-nonsense kind of a guy. He was the sort, you know, he, with Simon, what you saw was what you got. He'd roll his sleeves up, he'd muck in, and he would expect high standards. And after a turbulent period with national media exposure in the summer of 2012 uh, and the introduction of a head teacher who for a number of reasons had only stayed until Christmas, uh, there were concerns about the need to improve. And so there was a whole package really, which I think I had to take on board. But he just welcomed the parents and explained to them what he would do over the coming months, how he would do it, and made a promise to them that he would make things better. And that's exactly what he did. He, um, in his brief time here, I think he convinced parents that actually Castlevale is quite a normal place. Um, I look back on it as being privileged to have been asked to do that job and having been given the opportunity to do that job and in the context within which we were working I hope I was able to make a contribution which which stabilised the school and enabled the appointment of a new head teacher to happen and, and brought that head teacher into school which had gone from being defined by the Department for Education is being extremely high risk in the December to medium risk in the June uh, when the new head was appointed. And I was principal at Greenwood Academy between June uh, 2013 and I left in September of 2016. Harry French uh, was a good head teacher and was a, a nice fella and I think that that's why he's successful. Everybody can see that he's a nice fella. Um, he's a genuine, kind man and I think that the pupils really like Harry French because he could see from the word go that he was looking to do the best that he possibly could for them. And he was prepared to spend money doing this as well. He, he, he was not going to scrimp on their potential. He was going to invest in the school. I mean, some of the key challenges that, that we, we knew I had to address fairly quickly um, were to do with the role and the number of students who were coming and choosing the school 
through for first or second choices in the local area. Um, the school itself financially was, was not in a particularly strong position and that, that was causing a great deal of pressure. I think moreover the school had been through an, a period of real upheaval. Um, I was the fourth head teacher I think in an 18 month period. I think over the three years that I was in charge of the school, I think we managed to align everything to a really strong sense of purpose. Um, you know, you, you can't underestimate how much momentum and forward motion you can gain simply by making sure that everybody is aligned to the moral purpose that sits behind the school. And for us, it's about the young people. Everything that we did, every decision that we made, every minute um, aspect of our work was linked to kids. And I think that that's the way that a school should be led, managed, run on a daily basis. The school had been making bad national headlines as being a place where there was massive disruption. Not for Harry, he said, this is a place that is good, where the youngsters are good, and we want you to see it. Um, we started to get some really positive press, and not just local press, we started to get press um, from across Birmingham, and after a short while um, we started to get some national press about some of the work that we were doing, particularly around community development and engagement, which was really positive. His view was, come and look at what we do, we're proud of it, we're proud of our pupils and we're proud of our teachers. That was how his style, he was open, he was genuine, he was positive and he was very, very good. I knew that there was a real strength of commitment to the young people and to the community and really all I needed to do was release the potential. I look back on my time at Greenwood really fondly. Um, I miss it a lot. Um, I think that it, you, you don't find schools that sit within communities and who are genuinely community focused like Greenwood was and always has been very often. That brings us right up to the present and what better way to find out about the school now in its 50th year than from the current head teacher Mr Alan Bird. So Greenwood Academy has a, a very special feel to it. It's very much a, a community school but uh, and that's important because again it's, it's, it's clear then that the, the school is not only undertaking its um, primary purpose of, of great education for, for pupils but is also a, a resource and a, a provision that's very important to the, the, the wider community. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things about um, this school is that it's had good times, it's had bad times, but it's always drawn on the 50 years of history. Uh, and certainly that's something we're doing as, as, a, as a school this year in terms of really reflecting upon how those 50 years have, have, have passed and what's happened, both, like I say, the successes and the things that perhaps weren't so good, but also how that shapes the future. I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed this year is, and, and feel it's been a privilege really, has been part of um, that celebration of, of looking over the memory lane uh, and the 50 years and being able to see just how many young people have gone through and, and realised their ambitions, their dreams, um, their next steps into life, into adulthood and seeing them come back to the school and, and make the connection between their experiences being here just again reminds you why schools are so important. That the youngsters here over the course of this year have embraced um, that legacy as well and so the way that we've been able to bring visitors into the, into the academy and, and certainly the, 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 the pride that's gone both ways, the pride from those of what, what's happened previously and, and, the, and the fond memories that they've had but also the current pupils being able to share where they are now and their hopes and dreams and aspirations for that new building across the way. Um. I'm looking forward to the new school a lot because it means like more modern stuff and more modern technology. But I will miss like walking down the halls and like knowing your classrooms and because you're like really familiar in, in your environment. But I think having a new school is for the best. The new school looks like a great, a great school. It looks like something that will really represent Castlevale and Birmingham. I'd enjoy to go to the new school because it like it's more advanced and more modern compared to this school. But I think the one thing I'd miss about being here is that I know my way around it off by art. So when I go into the new school, it'd make me feel like a year seven again. The new school is kind of like a new opportunity for like Greenwood because they, they did used to have a bad reputation when it wasn't Greenwood, when it was Castlevale Performing Arts College. But 
The fact that all the old memories of from the past however many years are just going, just by knocking on one building down, it, it is really sad. It looks like a school that I think a lot of people will be attracted to and may want to go, but this school, when it gets knocked down, it's feel like it's going to take all the memory with it. It's going to take all the memory down, and obviously how long this has been here, the memory, there's so many memories, so many different things have happened within the school that it's going to be quite um, heartbreaking for some people that have spent their whole school life at this school for it to just be knocked down and not really to be, because it will still be in people's thoughts and be remembered, but it just won't be the same having this big old school like in, on Castle Vale and having just a new, more modern school. I think it's going to be sad when they knock the building down because my dad went here as well. I don't know, I just feel like I have so many memories in this school. I don't know, it's just weird seeing it like across the road, but it looks like a really nice building, so I feel like the school has had its, it's had its time. I feel like it kind of needs to be changed now anyway, but, yeah. And so the history has been something that's been very, very important about the way that we move from this school campus to the next one. Uh, and certainly something that we want to preserve and ensure is there for, for future generations to be able to appreciate uh, the educational journey that has taken place um, within, within Greenwood uh, and Castle Vale as a whole. I'm really excited about the future because of course having the privilege of being the, the principal that uh, takes um, a, a student population into a brand new building is, is, is both a, a privilege and also quite a, quite a, a huge undertaking. Greenwood should never forget where it's come from and where it sits within the, the community. It is at the heart of the community. So everything that it does should also have the question of and what's this going to give back? Um, and, and, I, and I certainly try to lead the school in, in that way. But there are so many reasons why the community can, can um, see this as a, as, a, as a larger part of their, their experience of living in the Vale. And I think that, that's, that's the essence, is the fact that the school's always undertaken its responsibility of being part of that, that life experience on the Vale um, that has really defined that relationship. It is a pleasure to say, obviously, that the school is on the up and um, that, that community deserves a great school. And certainly when I was there, um, the school was developing into something special and I hope that is fulfilled in the future. Greenwood should never lose, lose its roots. It is the school that serves the Castle Vale community and there is a uniqueness about the Castle Vale community. The two things that just can't be separated. That the school is, you know, it's, it's everything, isn't it, to the community. It's the future of their children. It's where they know their children are safe. It's, it's everything. So you can't, I don't care where, what area it's in, what school you're in, those two things go hand in hand. You can't be anything else. We've been overwhelmed by the level of engagement from ex-teachers, ex-pupils, governors, cleaners, night school students, sports teams, the list goes on. Overwhelmed, but not surprised. It goes without saying that this school holds a very special place in the hearts of many individuals and the community as a whole. And here's to another 50 years of fantastic memories.